Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Eric, for those kind of words. I think you omitted something important to me is that you were my advisor and I, I learned a huge amount and of course an old friend as well. So thank you and thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, I'm very honored to be here today uh, talking about this uh, ongoing work and I'm, I'm looking forward to your, um, to your um, comments. Um, so, as a way of an introduction, let me just say that um, it looks at um, the allocation of our life between private and public spaces, and this allocation is going to reflect three different things. Uh, the technological evolution, uh, as you all know, with AI, facial recognition, smartphones, and so on, there's been, a, and it's an understatement, an expansion of the public sphere. But more importantly, it's, uh, it's not a random um, expansion because our pride sphere is biased toward like-minded individuals. So the kings, the friends, and so on, they're often, uh, our colleagues are often like-minded. Second uh, determinant of the allocation is the law and the norm. So we have had a number of laws. Um, only in Europe, we have the European Court of Justice decision, the Google decision on the right to oblivion. We, of course, had in 2016, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. And more recently, we had an interesting uh, artificial intelligence act that I will recommend you to look at. Laws are, of course, not the only thing. And there, all, there are also norms, uh, which are very important. And we see also those norms evolving over time. Uh, we see... Um, norms to, to what doxing, outing, chasing people like paparazzis and so on, things change over time. And finally, and most importantly for us economists is of course that there are individual choices. So it's not the private and public spheres are completely endogenous and there are two possible uh, behavioral reactions that we are interested in. The first is to keep the same behavior and retreat in a safe space. The second one, is to change the overall behavior. So there are conceptual issues which have been studied mostly, I mean, uh, in much of the theoretical and empirical uh, work. Um, those are issues on which there is broad agreement on what's right or wrong. So people in general will agree that pollution or crime is not nice, that charitable contribution, uh, probably good provision, like in Rachel, Rachel's experiment earlier today, voting, blood donation is, is nice. Um, we are going to be interested more in divisive issues, um, which are quite uh, context specific, to be honest, but they are very important. Things like politics, uh, sexual orientation, religion, and all kinds of things from vaccines to uh, abortion. Now, the big difference between those two things is that the image concern or psychologists will say self-presentation concerns are, are different. So let's start with consensual behavior. A very typical model of consensual behavior is that you have some agent I taking some action AI um, and as some privately known type of preference types, uh, VI, so it could be, for example, uh, the extent of altruism, prosociality, and it's drawn from some cumulative distribution F. And then I get some reputational payoff, uh, which depends on personal beliefs. So the conditional beliefs about VI given the observed action AI, which is often summarized as a representative type, VI hat, which will be the expectation, the conditional expectation of VI. It doesn't have to be the case, just convenient in some cases to have some models to to use that. And in reduced form, because you want to accommodate lots of different uh, continuation games, um, those image payoffs uh, could be either be pure image concerns. So I just care about your thinking I'm generous or something like that, or, or even myself thinking that. Or it could be functional because a good reputation might actually increase my matching opportunities might trigger reciprocal altruism or something like that. In a number of papers, you can also affect the visibility of your action to the potential audience. And this framework accommodates both uh, demands for high reputation. So for example, in pro-sociality models, you want to appear as generous as possible. 
Or it could be a demand for some intermediate reputation like in uh, Doug, Berma, Doug Bernheim's theory of conformity, conformism. Now with uh, divisive behavior, uh, it's a bit different. Um, so again, you will have an agent AI, I, which is going to take an action AI, and we'll have some uh, type VI. Um, and again, we we'll want to ingratiate himself or himself with the audience. There will be two new features here. The first is that the judgment, the way to assess the behavior will depend on the receiver. Um, so the same behavior would be formed upon by some and liked by others. That's the definition of a divisive behavior. Um, reputation in, is in the eyes of the beholder. The second is that disclosure will be differential. So whether eyes behavior is observed will endogenously depend on the type VJ of the receiver, even so VJ is not directly observed by I. We'll see how it works. So an example of formalism, it's just an example, uh, we're going to actually spend a fair amount of time on, is that I's repetitional payoff with J, so this will be a payoff, will depend on basically um, J's estimate uh, of VI, conditional on the information that J receives, and VJ. So it's not only depends on basically the updated mean of I, VI, but also on the opinions of, of the receiver J. So a little yeah, will be much more detailed run. There will be a separated as a demand for safe spaces. Um, the image concerns are going to imply that we will want our behavior to be known to the in-group of like-minded individuals choosing the same behavior. So basically we want to disclose to people who think like us but not to the outgroup. Um, and indeed, full transparency may make us shy to act. Uh, full transparency will mean disclosure to everyone. So how is it achieved? Well, it's achieved through the retreat into a safe space. It can be a physical space like home, a pride club, a church, a Masonic lodge, a bullfight ring. I mean, the people do not like corridors, right? political party, or it could be virtual. And Facebook was very good at getting people who think alike together in small groups or larger groups, actually. Um, now, the retreat in the same space is going to generate less hostility, and it will have some kind of shelter, shelter aspect. But it's going to come also with spike costs. The first, as we will see, is that there will be a deviation of behavior for from authenticity. So authenticity is how you behave when you have full privacy. You are, nobody is watching you. Um, but of course, in a safe space, you'll still be watched by your in-group. So mm -hmm. there will be a deviation from authenticity. And there will be hiding costs. Uh, there will be two kinds of hiding costs that we are going to, to discuss. The first one is the reduced use of a public space. So, for example, you know, when uh, gay people were thrown upon, um, then, or in those society where it still is, then, you know, gay people cannot enjoy the public space together. So that's, that's a substantial cost. Or it could be the case that you try to change your social graph so as to be with people you can trust not to disclose. So people who are like you, but of course that reduces your set of desirable relationship and the diversity of those relationships. And that contrary to the first one be, will be a completely endogenous hiding cost because it also depends on who is going to, to do that. The welfare impact of technology and law is going to depend on those considerations also on other considerations. So um, if you just, forget about behavior and just you look at the social benefits on the image side. So you look at the image stuff. 
sometimes the image is just a pure reputation stealing. So that's what's called positional, positional image in sociology. So basically, um, you know, it's just redistributive. So you redistribute the image uh, payoff among agents. And there are lots of papers which has assumed that. And we can do that also for um, divisive issues. Usually it's assumed that in the framework of uh, consensual issues. But it may not be a zero sum game uh, or constant sum game. You could have a deadweight loss. Um, so the typical example, especially in countries where the norms or the rule of laws are not very well developed, is that if you have people who are very hostile to you, they, they can ostracize you, discriminate, uh, be violent with you, and so on. Okay. So that will be the shelter component. The safe space will protect you in part against that. But then we'll see there also, and that's, uh, that would be an add-on, which is a very important add-on, but we are going to ignore for the moment, there will be also collateral social costs. Because once you have joined in a space, you have joined a safe space, then you are going to become more Catholic than the Pope. Um, so why? Because you will have your in-group. And your in-group, you will want to ingratiate yourself further or prove that you are a true believer. Or else you could be threatened by uh, the people in your in group, threatened of exclusion from the group or outing. Okay, so you also get a theory of exclusion and outing as a as a as a byproduct of the of the theory, and that's going to result in one-sided narratives, conspiracy theories, hate speech, uh, and so on. All you have on Facebook groups, right? Um, and this is tribal behavior. So you, are, you have the shelter part and you also have the tribal part. There's a huge literature I won't have time to review on pro-social behavior, on conformity, on countervailing incentives. Uh, the modeling is rather different and the question and conclusions are, are rather different. And there's another uh, broader social science debate um, which connects to that. Um, Philosophers, of course, have talked a lot about privacy. Um, they often actually have a positive connotation of privacy and authenticity. So their view is that privacy gives you authenticity. So basically you behave in a normal way. You are not always posturing when you are in a private space. And that view has, it's also a view of emancipation, which has a lot of impact on current laws and and so on. So Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre talked a lot about that, or Bernard Williams, for example, you know, his view was that to act morally is to act autonomously, not as a result of social pressure. Okay, so there's a connection, of course, with the philosophy work. So let me, let me describe the model now. Um, so you have a mass one of agents. Um, we are going to focus on in agent I, who is going to choose an action AI, which will be minus one, zero, or plus one. Actually, a better terminology for zero is no action. Minus one might be left, you know, your left militancy, for example, and plus one might be right militancy or something like that. AI will be staying passive neutral, and capital AI absolute value equals one means that you're acting at the cost C, which can be zero or positive. So uh, it could be a cost of time. It could be a cost of donation, of going to a demonstration or whatever. So the non-image payoff is very simple. It's a very standard. There is a sorting condition. VI will be your type and it will be privately known. AI will be your action. And C will be the cost you incur if you act. So again, VI is private information. Grow from F of VI. We are going to assume symmetry because it's going to make it think simple to, to, to compute. And the cumulative distribution will be unimodal. Um, actually, it's going to satisfy, satisfy the, mono, the monotone hazard rate. And it's going to be symmetric around zero and it will have a mean. So if it has a mean, this mean is necessarily zero, okay? 
Now, let's come to the image concern back, because that's the important thing. So let's assume that you are uh, H and I, your reputational payout vis-a-vis -vis H and J um, will depend, sorry, the type of here is a J. So we'll depend on the type of, of the receiver VJ and the estimate of your VI given the information that HNJ the receiver has, okay? And it's going to be endogenous, of course. That's one possible uh, view. Uh, later on, there is an alternate formulation. So instead of being a representative member of a perceived group, it could be a random member. So your reputational payout is a VJ will be more something like that. So you, you take the conditional distribution DFJ of VI, and then you apply this reputation. So I've done both, that's, that's fine. Um, so let's come back to this reputational payoff. And again, apologies for the typo here. So the total, rep your total reputational payoff of H and R in society, so you take all of the agents who have type VJ and you sum up the reputational payoffs, okay? So just to preview a little bit more, um, you will have this reputational payoff on top of your material payoff. Um, and then there might be some uh, uh, hiding costs, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about later on. So for the moment, I, take, I keep it completely general. And given that the model is symmetrical, I'm going to look for a symmetric equilibrium. So they will be cut off. So if, I mean, you have, you have a sorting condition. So if VI is greater than V star, you choose A equals plus one. If VI is less than V star, you choose A, um, A equals minus one. And you also choose a, a disclosure strategies that we are going to discuss, which will be symmetric as well. It turns out, and this is much more complicated, that there is no asymmetric equilibrium, but we are going to, for today, just assume symmetry. So, we are going to make assumptions on those image concerns, and we are going to try to make reasonable assumptions. So the first one, of course, is to assume symmetry. So if you change VAT, your reputation to minus VAT, and you change the audience from V to minus V, you get the same reputational payoff. Um, the second one is this test for dissonance. So the assumption here is that we want to ing ingratiate oneself with others. So we want to look more alike to them. So we want to basically say, I'm like you, I, I love you. <laughs> so, um, so for example, if V is positive, of course, you, by symmetry, you can do everything in the negative uh, side, and your reputation is less than V, then increasing your reputation toward V increases your reputational pair. So you want to look close to the other, right? So that, that basically, and actually, um, distance is going to be to to uh, to be convex. A cost is going to be convex. So R one one will be negative. So we really want to not to be too far from uh, from the others uh, in terms of perception. Uh, it could be zero, by the way. Uh, it's going to be the case in one example we gave. The fourth assumption is a little bit co more complicated, but uh, and uh, by the way it's uh, stronger than, than is needed. I mean, it's not yet quite proved, but it's much stronger than needed. Um, so M plus of V star is the expectation of V. That's a truncated mean given that V is greater than V star. So the assumption is that an agent choosing a AI equals one gains from being perceived by the in-group, by the in-group, those who have a v, v greater than V star so between V star and plus infinity, better than being perceived as a moderate. So you're better off being perceived as the average member of the group than, than the marginal member of the group. Actually, believe that uh, you could replace by zero here, yeah, but okay. So it turns out that those four assumptions are satisfied by a number of examples. So the first is the positional image. So Positional image is that reputation of agent with type V when having reputation, I'm sorry, an agent was reputation V hat 
when the audience has type V, gets mu times theta of V times V at. Okay. So by the way, R11 is equal to zero in that case. Uh, it's really uh, linear in V at, and theta is anti-symmetric. So it's an increasing function, negative in the negative space, positive in the positive space. And total reputation is constant in society. So it's just reputation stealing. So basically, if I, if I manipulate my reputation, then that's going to change your reputation as well. So I'm going to steal it from you. Another one is what I call placating, a placating image concern. So again, I want to be perceived as close in values as possible to the audience. So here, it all depends on the distance between my reputation V hat and the audience type Z, okay? So for P greater than one. So it's what I call the modify LP norm because it's not a true LP norm because there is no homogeneity here, okay? That's, uh, that's one possibility. Alternatively, you can define the total reputational payoff directly and work from there, that you can do that as well. So the same, now the true LP norm is basically, again, I wrote it with, with the audience VJ. So I take the integral of all the audience members types and here's the distance between their type and their perception of I, I types to the P and all of that to minus one minus P. And when I take the limit, uh, there you have to assume a finite support uh, between minus V and V, the limit when P goes to infinity, then basically that reduces to this. So basically you focus on the most hostile person. So you really want to calm down the most hostile person, right? Because that's the one, that's the one who is going to do a lot, you, do you a lot of damage, okay? So you can do that. In all those examples, the mu is a parameter of intensity of image concern. So you can play with mu. And of course, if, we, if you want a mu unique equilibrium, in all those games, you need mu not too large because with large image concern, you can easily have multiple equilibrium. So an upper bound on welfare, I'm, I'm looking at how I'm doing in time, but uh, you know, in terms of, um, of welfare, um, an upper bound is, you can show in this, in this model, is basically full privacy. And full privacy is going to be a sort of experiment because it's never going to be an equilibrium, never. So um, full privacy means nobody observes you, okay? In that case, you get authenticity. So the cutoff V star is just a cost C. So basically you compare the, the benefit of, uh, engaging in this activity and the cost, and you don't care about image. You're completely authentic. So that's a cutoff for full privacy. And furthermore, that's the result is that under the previous assumption, the total agent reputational payoff is maximized. So basically you get the highest possible reputational payoff in society. And on top of that, you get authenticity. So that's perfect. Unfortunately, that's not an equilibrium because as we're going to see at the very least, the people in your in-group will know you belong to the in-group. So they will be image concerned. They will always be image concerns, okay? So we are going to see that in a minute, okay? But it's just a benchmark. So an important thing is to understand the demand for reputation. So imagine that action AI is going to be chosen by types who have an intensity of preferences greater than some V star. And it's going to be observed, and that's actually how the EKM is going to look like, is going to be observed by peers, or the, by the way, what I would call the in-group is the people who are basically choosing the same action as you do, okay? And it's going to be hidden from the out-group, so everybody else, with priority X, where X is going to be endogenous. And I ask myself, in such a world, what kind of reputation would I like to have? I cannot distinguish, of course, 
according to type because VJ is not observable. Um, but if I can distinguish according to actions AJ, then is what I would like to do, ignoring any cause of self-presentation. The answer is I would like, it's very simple, I would like to disclose to people who choose the same action as I do, and not to disclose to people who choose a different action. And that includes the people who don't choose an action, okay? So it's a very simple thing because I just want people who take the same action to know and, and the others not to know. And that's what's going to happen if there is no self-presentation cost. So that's what, I, what is done here. Let's assume that H equals zero. So there is no hiding cost. So you can do whatever you want and disclose as you want. So from the previous result, X equals one is an equilibrium. So X equals one means that when you act, you're hiding with priority one. When you don't act, you have nothing to hide. <laughs> Nobody knows anyway. You are not doing anything and you cannot prove that you are not doing anything. That if you act, you can, you can uh, hide. Now the cutoff V star is going to be given if it's interior, I mean, there are, if C is very small, you could have a corner solution where everybody acts uh, at zero, okay, V star equals zero. But if it's positive, then basically it is my payoff from acting when I'm, uh, when I'm the cutoff, is my cost of acting. And then if, I, if I'm hiding, then I'm going to have an impact, the hiding action, the action of the, the fact that I'm hiding is going to have an impact only on the in group. Because the out group will never know any way that what I'm doing. Okay. It's only the in group we, we will know. So the in group will basically think I'm, I have a type on average M plus of VS. But if I don't, um, so remember, M plus of Vs is the upward truncated mean given that V is greater than Vs. If I don't, um, if I, I don't let it know, uh, it be known by, by the in-group, then they will think I'm M minus of Vs. So M minus is the downward truncated mean. So the expectation given that V is less than Vs. So this is a question that gives you uh, that gives you the cutoff. And from the previous assumptions, um, which is assumption four actually, then uh, Vs is less, less than C. So basically uh, you over signal. So there, there, are, there are types, you, you know, there's more acting than under authenticity because you are signaling to the in-group. Okay, it's very, very simple. So there is this over signaling, over activity. Now, if you have costly self-presentation, and sorry, there is one or two slides with a little bit of notation. So la let's introduce that a cost H positive. So for the moment, it's exogenous. So think of H as, okay, if I want to hide, I'm not going to use a public space and it has a fixed cost for me, okay? Um, so what is the net benefit from acting in a safe space? Well, that's a benefit from acting, V star if I'm the cutoff, minus C. And then I look at the total reputation when I choose A equals one, when the cutoff V star, and when the priority of hiding when you act is X. But I have to look at what will I, I will do if I didn't act. If I didn't act, I would have reputation R zero, function of V star and X, okay? So by the way, so this is very abstract, but there is a very simple result, which is that R zero is, is decreasing in X. So if you don't act and the others are hiding, then you, 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 are, you are suspected by everyone because people think you might be an extremist, okay? So there's an externality actually on non, non, people who don't act. So if X increases and R zero decreases. You can do the same thing when you don't hide and you act transparently, 
So here, T for transparency. Then your benefit from acting is V star minus C. And then you have your total reputation when you are transparent. It doesn't depend on X because in any case, there you, you, you are totally transparent on what you do. So there's no suspicion or anything like that. It's totally clear, minus R zero, okay? And then you have AQM conditions, okay? You can have a safe space AQM X equals one. You can have a transparent AQM X equals zero. And you can have a mixed AQM in which you randomize between hiding and not hiding. Okay, so this is very formal. Um, I make two more assumptions. One is just to ensure uniqueness. So those functions are increasing in V star. Uh, that's always the case if image concerns are not too large. And either you have finite support or say if you have the LP norm, the true LP norm, then you have no factors. So you know, the, the density falls sufficiently, so, sufficiently fast. The other assumption is just to shorten the analysis, which is, uh, you, yeah, I don't want a corner solution at Vista equals zero, but you can do it as well, it's not difficult. So then the AQM is unique and symmetric and is characterized as, as in the figure. So basically what's happened for the general case, here it is H, which is the hiding cost. And here is a cut of V star. As I said, for if there is no hiding cost, then it's a safe space equilibrium. There is a lot of signaling because you signal to in group, okay. And then as H um, increases, um, it be, you stay in a safe space equilibrium, but it becomes more costly, so there are fewer people acting. And then you move to a mixed right equilibrium, and then finally you move to a transparency AQM, the adding cost is so high that you end up being transparent. You, you don't want to fight against it because it's too expensive. Okay, then you become transparent. Okay, I see Eric showing something. Also, I cannot read what Eric is showing. 15 minutes until the Q&A. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Um, okay, so that's, that's a pattern. Um, and actually, when you have transparency, as you see there, it's a reverse is that you, you have too little activity, people are scared of acting. Okay. Um, and that's, that's the case if R11 is negative. Okay. So, which is not the case for, for the positional image. Um, and there, the positional image, even if the hiding cost is high, then um, the uh, and the transparency equilibrium, you basically get authentic behavior, okay? And actually welfare is maximized in, in the um, hiding, in the transparency case, okay? Um, because it's a zero sum game, image is positional, so we don't care socially. The opposite is the max norm. The max norm uh, basically Tell, it's something like that. There is always too little activity because you are very averse to be, you know, you know, being, you know, you are, you are afraid of hostility. Um, and welfare is continuously decreasing in age. So they're forcing people to be transparent is a disaster. Okay. And then we could discuss maybe in the QA and A what, what those two situations correspond to. One thing you can do, by the way, I have no questions. So I mean, I've been totally clear. Or oh, Eric fell asleep, I don't know. Either way, no. <laughs> okay. Um, dynamics of, so you can do that. Uh, also, you can do it in a repeated game. So you can look at a repeated game in which you act in each period. So you choose AI tau in period tau, and then you could have a, um, your reputation uh, at the tau, and then I forgot the hiding cost, okay? I forgot the hiding cost, okay, there. Um, so it's, it's basically a repeated game, it's a repeated situation, and I, I looked at two parker cases where H says zero, and then they can always be in safe spaces, or H is equal to, is high enough so that you have transparency. Now, I don't have uniqueness. <laughs> Let me transparent. 
I, I know transparency is not always good, but you know, let me be transparent. I don't necessarily have uniqueness, but I think those are the right equilibria. So I, I don't have the right refinement in a sense yet. But basically, if you have low hiding costs, so if you have a safe space society, then the equilibrium, repeated game equilibrium is the same, the right equilibrium in a sense is the same as in a static case. So it's a repeated static case. So basically you, are, you stay in the safe space or you stay doing nothing or you stay in the other safe space. And you can often understand that because if you start in a safe space and you move, uh, say you do nothing, then you betray your in group. So you, you lose reputation vis-a-vis your in group, but you don't ingratiate yourself with that respect to the out group with, because they will never know anyway. Okay. And conversely, if you are a late comer into the safe space, you won't be taken very seriously. Okay, because you have visited it in, to start with. So basically there we get repeated static outcome. If you have transparency, because you have high in cost, you get the reverse. Actually, you get Gaussian dynamics. Um, you get something like this. I mean, this is in the case of continuous time and max norm. Uh, basically, you get more and more activity over time. So you, you basically get no activity at the start. I mean, here V is the upper bound on, on, of, the, of the support. And then you, you move toward transparency over time. And that's because if you refrain from acting at the start, you show you're not an extremist. And then you, you can behave uh, more easily and, and act. So, yeah. so you basically get cause and dynamics if you have transparency. Um, just a word on reputation of the random member of a group. Um, there, it's exactly as in the positional image groups because it's going to be a zero sum game. So you get the same conclusion. Now, those are extensions. And I think they are kind of interesting uh, for, especially for, uh, for, for thinking about those issues. Um, I told you one way of uh, hiding is to um, basically uh, not enjoy the public space, right? Um, you, re you retreat into a safe space, a club or, or whatever, a political party or you don't, you, you don't use a safe space, okay? Um, that's one thing. But the other thing is just to ask friends you can trust because they belong to the same, they, they adopt the same behavior basically. Uh, you can always, if they out you, you can always out them, for example. Okay. Um, so I argue that a good representation of the cost of moving from a graph F, which is the initial graph with potential uh, partners everywhere in the group, in the society, to a more restrict graph of people who are selected is basically the L1 distance. Okay. Um, so basically you have, for example, less diversity. If you just want to have people like you, you have a less diverse group of friends. Or if you have fewer opportunities, if you have another dimension of uh, liking. Now it's a bit different from the previous one because I mean, you get the same conclusion, but on top of that, you get strategic complementarities because if very few people join a safe space or adopt this behavior of having a social graph of people like them, then you don't get much diversity in, in doing so. Whereas if people do that a lot, then you, you can basically have this virtual social um, safe space and, and not lose much diversity. And also there's, there are some dynamics. Once you have changed your friends, you have changed your friends forever. There is a fixed cost. Outing and coming out. Okay, that's actually something which I think is comes out, if I can say, of the theory. Um, but here I make one more assumption. So if I join a safe space, of course, I, I'm, at, I'm threatened by, because I could be outed by someone in the safe space, maybe by the sponsor of the safe space or by people in safe space. And of course, in terms of image concern, it's going to be very costly if the person is a celebrity. And of course, the many outed people are, are celebrities or people who have a stake 
at keeping confidential. Um, what's more difficult to understand is the demand for outing. So you understand why people are hurt by outing, but it, you, it's harder to understand why there's a demand for outing. So in, I, I conjecture that uh, basically it's an assumption that the community becomes more mis mainstream. Basically, if you out celebrities, for example, that makes a community more, more mainstream and that can benefit the community in terms of image. And that may also trigger coming out. Coming out is different from outing, it's voluntary, right? Now, this is something very important, collateral damages. Uh, so for, for the moment, that may be the shelter aspect, but the tribe aspect is important. So if you add an additional action signal, young AI, so it could be some kind of BI action. Uh, so for example, it could be spreading narratives or refraining from spreading narratives. Uh, engaging in some hostile action against the out group or something like that. So trying to prove that you are a true believer. So that may arise uh, either because you want to show off vis-a-vis -vis the people in the safe space, you want, really want to show that you're a true believer. That's one possibility and it's completely voluntary. But once you have joined the safe space, you have a strong incentive to do that, which you will not have if you were transparent. Because if you were transparent, it would be much more costly to prove that you are a true believer. Or you might be vulnerable to pressure from the in-group or the sponsor of the in-group. So they might threaten to exclude you or out you if you are not hostile or if you start, um, if you start saying that uh, man is responsible for climate change or something like that, right? Then you, you'll be outed from, <laughs> from the in-group, right? Okay, so summary, uh, five minutes, oh yeah. I'll, I have lots of time. Thanks, Eric. Um, platforms and governments are trespassing on our privacy, as you know. Um, the public policy debate emphasizes the benefit from privacy. It's mainly about that. Okay. Um, and the benefit of uh, privacy, of course, is that it allows you to be able authentically, more authentically, without fear of hostility from non like minded people. So it protects us somehow. Um, the economics literature focuses more on transparency. Somehow the standard argument that it, transparency makes people more accountable for their behavior. Now, what I've been doing today is to study divisive issues. So like politics, religion, social, sexual orientation, social roles, of course, is very important as well. So I develop a framework for thinking about those things in which opinions about the judgment of, of an agent is contingent on the audience view and the information is endogenously contingent on the audience view. Um, I argue that the proper comparison is not between full privacy and transparency because at the very least people want to ingratiate themselves with their in-group and they may, dis dis they may discover this in-group by joining a safe space. Um, the joining of a safe space is going to capture the quest for a shelter, um, but it also implies reputation stealing externalities on those who don't act because they are suspected by people who act. They are suspected of being on the wrong side. The welfare implications depend on the concavity of the reputational payoff. Um, when it's mainly about reputation stealing, then Transparency is, is good because it reduces posturing and promotes authenticity. Um, when it's more, more con conca concave or convex, whatever, <laughs> um, then safe space are going to act as shelters against discrimination, violence, and uh, pogroms and the like. Um, and then it's going to dominate transparency. Um, now, that the add-on part at the end, I went a bit fast. You cannot assess safe spaces without considering their collateral damages. Basically the fact that there will be even more posturing within the safe space because you, are, you want to show you're a true believer or because you are forced by the others to do that. 
And of course, that means that there will be fake news and nar fake narratives, bad narratives uh, circulating. There will be violence against the art group. There will be things like that. And in that sense, that qualifies the notion that the shared safe space is a shelter. It's also a threat for social cohesiveness and democracy. So let me stop here and thank you very much both for the invitation, for the attention, and I'm looking forward to your comments. So th thank you very much, Jean. Uh, we have uh, about 12 minutes left for, for Q&A. Uh, what I suggest is that if you want to ask a question, uh, you raise your electronic hand and, um, and I, will, I will recognize you. Uh, maybe as, as chair, uh, I, can, I can ask the first question. Uh, th there's a uh, there's a general perception that the world has become more tribal uh, that that we've uh, retreated uh, into our own uh, individual safe spaces, if you like. What what does your model have to say about what has changed to uh, to promote this tribalism? Okay, I agree with you. It's a kind of paradox because uh, you know the, those new technologies basically expose our behavior to everyone, and at the same time, we tend to retreat into safe spaces. The Facebook group example is actually a good example, in which actually Facebook has helped you actually find people like you. Of course, we are in a safe space here. We, we are among uh, game theorists, right? <laughs> but you know this. I think it's, uh, I don't think we are doing any harm or, or you know, <laughs> having bad narratives that are bad for the rest of society. But, you know, in Facebook groups, of course, there are some very bad narratives uh, circulating and uh, hatred circulating in those groups. So uh, that's something I haven't studied, but it's clear that technology both takes some of your privacy, but it also helps you gain some privacy because you, you can, uh, you can basically meet, meet people like you, and actually you can have, a, you know, an avatar. <laughs> you can basically uh, do that as well, and you know, uh, do lots of things in a private space um, that you could not do before. So it, it may it may also help with that, but it definitely it is a paradox. That, but I think it can be explained somewhat uh, using the the paper. So I am looking for raised hands among attendees, but I don't, I don't see any. Um, there was a question on differential privacy. Actually, oh yes, so, 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 sorry, that, 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 that was sent in. Uh, yes, what is your opinion of differential privacy? Well, I mean, this is of course, uh, Actually, adjusting basically how visible your behavior is uh, by others, right? Uh, trying to make sure that using uh, various data, you cannot uh, recoup who has, uh, who is actually generating those data. Um, and there's a huge research on that, an interesting one. I, I, I'm not an expert, but uh, but but the question is, uh, uh, why do we care about differential privacy? And and there, you know, the we might want to distinguish between uh, consensual behaviors and, and divisive behaviors. So divisive behaviors, of course, we, we care about that because, uh, you know, let's assume that uh, there's a group out there who, who really hate game theorists, right? Uh, they, they really, if they see us, they are going to kill us or something. Then, you know, the privacy is, is pretty good and you, uh, you don't want people to be able to figure out that Eric Maskin attended, attended his conference, for example. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's one thing. But if it's not, you know, it's, it's less of an issue, of course. Uh, but even for consensual behavior, there's still the issue that you might actually over signal. And that happens mainly in small, for small externalities. So the theory of um, image concerns usually tell, tell you that we don't produce enough public goods or we are not nice enough. But sometimes we also 
uh, kind of over signaling, not under signaling, we over signal in a sense, because if you think about um, wishing happy birthday to your, face, to your 2000 Facebook friends, you don't even know them, but you wish them happy birthday. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, just like in the science fiction movies, you smile all the time to everyone just to get a better rating. That's sort of signaling, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, basically, you have to say whether those behaviors are consensual or divisive, and then try to think whether there is over or on, under signaling. And that would be a, a way of reading things. But I see differential privacy um, as basically looking at how much information you release about the behavior and how, how, whether people can be identified or not uh, with stochastically, of course. Hey, um, I was wondering about your, uh, I think you briefly mentioned at some point this uh, right to be forgotten stuff that's going on in Europe. Um, and I was trying to think about how that uh, fits into your model. Is that going to be like, I could be outed, but then I could undo my outing or, I, yeah, uh, I don't know quite how to, how to think about that in the context of your model. The right to be forgotten and the right to oblivion can be formalized um, uh, in a way which is pretty close to actually what the European Court of Justice said, or almost any religion also has that, and many laws including in the US has this right to oblivion, at least in some domains, not always. Um, because, I mean, the, the standard reason for that is of course, if you, you know, the general idea is that if you commit a misdeed, you pay for it. And once you have paid for it, you start with a clean slate. I mean, maybe, I, maybe I'm too much of a game series, I don't know, I'm, I'm brainwashed, but you know, my view is that uh, it, you know, once you have paid for your misdeed, you start all over again and your incentives are restored. That's what theory tells you. And it's not that far from uh, what religions say as well, actually. They say, you know, you, you, you have the right to start with a clean slate. It's, but I would present that more as an efficiency way, an efficiency argument. Now, of course, with the web, with internet, it's very hard to get the, you know, the, the right to oblivion has kind of disappeared. You know, if there are copies on the web everywhere, you know, how do you enforce that? I mean, you, you can ask Google, and that's that's what happens in uh, about forty to fifty percent of the of the requests are actually being um, uh, being accepted. Actually, there are some funny requests as well. As you might imagine, all the politicians have requests to to delete a lot of stuff. But you know, by and large. Um, you know, you can ask Google to do it, but if there are copies out there, you know, what can you do? I mean, <laughs> and you don't want that to, uh, to happen for every behavior. So for example, if the politician has been very corrupt repeatedly, certainly you don't want this politician in 10 years from now to, to come back and, and be elected, right? <laughs> so you don't, you don't want a full right to oblivion, right? Yeah, I guess in uh, your, so your argument is that in offline, like traditional societies, we sort of have a norm of forgiveness that doesn't I, I think in, in the old time you move, you change location. <laughs> That's what you did, right? Or people forgot if it was a small misbehavior, people for, forget and you can redeem yourself. But if you have a big misbehavior, you just change a village or... <laughs> Or you, you go to a big city or something. Al Alistair Irvine has a hand raised. Alistair, would you like to ask your question? Am I live? I hope I'm live. Um, yes, you're live. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a quick question about the demand for outing part, because I think, you know, in some way there's kind of socially desirable outings if there's a politician that's continuously hypocritical. But at the same time, I think in the UK, we have kind of a history of destructive outings in terms of outing 
celebrities whose behavior is, you know, not really a matter for their celebrity. Is that if you have any thoughts on that, that'd be quite interesting. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I, I think you have answered the question yourself, actually, because in those examples you have in mind, you you mentioned hypocritical, right? The hypocrisy. Um, so that means that you really have two dimensional type, right? You have one type, which is say, you know, being gay or being some whatever, you know, in the time where it was frowned upon. And the other type is, you know, campaigning for family life and against the gays, and, you know, which we know many politicians have done in the past. And in that case, there is a, there's basically a consensual issue. No, nobody likes hypocrites, right? And then there is a more horizontal issue about, you know, how people view a behavior. So our thing destroys a person and it's bad per se because, you know, there are some stupid people who are actually aggressive and don't like uh, this kind of behavior. But at the same time, you have this uh, vertical dimension of um, hypocrisy where you would like to punish the guy, right? <laughs> you would like to punish the guy. So in that case, you know, in a sense, you have answered the question yourself by saying three. In that case, it's a two-dimensional type. Any last questions? We've got about one minute left. And I, I guess I was just maybe join in to Alistair's question is that, uh, perhaps that's sort of the, the crux of the issue that um, much of this information is so high dimensional, right? So if you started by saying that um, technology allowed public lives, but it also allowed sort of multiplicity of private lives, and it's in this, in this balance, I guess, where um, trade-offs all of a sudden become sort of difficult um, and, and, and pop possibly very costly for individuals, right? To to orient themselves with one in-group and then having another in-group in mind that um, they need to, you know, both shelter, but also disclose at the same time. So I think the, it's just Especially a if you, if you want to keep your social graphs separate, for example. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking it is this, this, this high dimensionality that makes it more difficult to evaluate whether we want to create more safe spaces or fewer. Yes. Well, that's right. So you mean like I, I can have multiple personalities that I might not like, you know, I have my drag queen personality that I want to keep separate from my professional one. Yes. And 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 you know, we are we basically now allowed to have multiple private lives in that way. Um, good point, yes. 